Good afternoon and welcome to the 12th edition of Tata Literature Live, the Mumbai International Lit Fest 2021, co-sponsored by Tata Steel and Tata Projects and powered by Courtridge. The session is presented by British Council. Coming up now is the session titled About an Author, The Funny Thing About Truth. And the author is the remarkable Nick Hornby, who has this to say about truth, and I quote, the truth will set you free, either that or it will get you a punch in the nose. One of the most popular British authors of the last 25 years, Nick Hornby is the writer responsible for the iconic bestsellers, Fever Pitch and High Fidelity. Many of his books have been the subjects of successful big screen adaptations. He has also written a book of music criticism entitled 31 Songs, apart from numerous essays. His latest novel, Just Like You, was published last year. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me goosebumps and immense pleasure at the same time to invite Nick Hornby to this conversation. To converse hello. with him, hello, hello. And to converse with him is India's most intelligent comedian, as declared by the BBC, <clears throat> prolific playwright, stand up comic, screenwriter, Anubhav Pal. Over to you, Anubhav. Um, Hello, Nick Hornby. Um, I'm actually really, really nervous, uh, Nick, to have this conversation. I've been a fan of yours for most of my life. Um, and I did not think that uh, someone as huge as you uh, would be kind enough to show up at our literary festival. So we are immensely delighted to have you. Um, uh, Thank you. you. You have no idea how easy it is to persuade me to turn up to something. <laughs> I've been, I've been uh, reading about how you often talk about how uh, where you write, sitting and writing is quite tedious and that you, you, you are quite happy to get out and do other things. Yes, um, it's, uh, I mean, as you know, a lot of the job is, is solitary and um, uh, I think that bit in The Shining, where you see that Jack Nicholson has been writing All Work and No Play Makes Jack a Dull Boy, is actually the, the secret fear of the writer, that you've spent all day writing gibberish and there's no one to stop you. Um, so uh, any, any job I can do that involves other people, uh, I'm very keen. I've, I've been doing a lot of film writing the last few years, and uh, one of the things I like about it is that you can pretend that... Um, you are important enough to have a meeting, which uh, I'm, I'm not as a book writer. <laughs> now, before I get into it, Nick, I have to tell you, maybe you know this already, uh, a while ago, before I ask about the books or any of this, uh, you wrote an article about Arsene Wenger's leadership at Arsenal Football Club. And what? the article is titled, Why Arsenal, Why Arsene Wenger Had to Leave Arsenal. And that article went viral in India. Did you know this? No, I didn't know that. So ESPN India carried the story. And uh, clearly... I, 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 I remember writing it, but um, I, I had no idea about the India thing. So uh, I, I, I assume it went to ESPN Worldwide first. ESPN India ran it. And it spread like wildfire. I assume there is a huge arsenal fan base in India. There's a huge English Premier League fan base. And um, I've actually written down a couple of comments that came from that article. I thought you, wanted, you might want to hear it. Okay, okay. The, the first gentleman said, this cannot be Nick Hornby, the award-winning writer. <laughs> and the next guy said, I love Nick Hornby. What's his deal with Arsenal? What's his deal? Oh, okay. <laughs> so these, so which leads me to the first thing I want to ask you about, which is Fever Pitch, which you've said is a memoir. Yeah. Worldwide bestseller, massive hit. Is everything in it true? Yes. Um, I mean, there are bits of dialogue every now and again that I couldn't possibly have remembered verbatim, uh, but certainly. They were in the spirit of the dialogue that happened. Um, but no, it was the discipline of the book that um, I could only work with uh, what I'd done, what I had, what my memories are. So 
all the relationships with family are true and um uh, 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 I, I didn't I didn't want to, to make anything up but it was all the points at which my experience inter intersected with lots of other fans those are the things that I wrote about the movie became fictionalized um, but but the book is true and my follow-up question to that is is there something around the fandom of Arsenal Football Club which makes it different than any of the other clubs? Is it almost religious in its, in its... No, I think that one of the reasons the book worked is that um, it was taken up by fans of other clubs because they felt exactly the same way about Manchester United or Newcastle or Everton or any of the others. It's, it, it's, it was a book about our relationship with something that we can't control. And I think any sports fan has that relationship? I mean, we have um, the Indian Premier League cricket tournament, and I'm yeah. from Calcutta, and I'm a fan of a cricket team, unfortunately named the Calcutta Knight Riders. I don't know why we named that, but um, but it has tested my matrimonial relationship many times. <laughs> uh, but it, but it's relatively new, right? Very new, 2010. Yeah, so. I mean, I think that is one thing with some of the big English football clubs that um, there are lots of people there whose father supported that team, whose grandfather supported that team. And um, periods of history last 15, 20 years. You know, it, it's, uh, you can get locked into a cycle of failure. You can lo get locked into a cycle of winning. Um, my uh, our Arsenal's last great age ended in... 2005, 2006, and uh, my my sons were too young to remember it. So they think Arsenal is a kind of losers club, um, <laughs> even though they go to every game. And uh, I still think of them as this Arsene Wenger's triumphant procession through through uh, the English Premier League, you know, three, four times. And um, uh, we have different perspectives simply because of their ages. And for the record, you are still a fan. I'm, st I'm still a fan. I, I told you before this session started that I wanted no audience questions about yesterday. Um, Arsenal uh, suffered a catastrophic defeat, which was uh, very disappointing because we hoped we were getting better. And then it turned out we weren't. And uh, uh, I still go to every game. Every home game. Brilliant. And I have a, one last question about sort of the fever pitch era, yeah. which is that it seems like British humor around sort of British football fandom is a very specific kind of thing. Um, when that story became a massive Hollywood film with Jimmy Fallon, um, yeah. And it became about the Chicago Red, the Boston, Boston, Boston Red Sox, Red Sox yeah. who I assume also have a curse and a, and a sort of myth around them. Did anything, did you feel anything changed in the DNA of the story once it became American and it became a massive Hollywood film? Well, I think um, one thing that made sense to me is that American sports fandom is, is very intense uh, about yeah baseball um, and football, but they did not understand our sport. So it made sense to me that if they were going to remake the movie, they would have to change the sport. So it would make sense to an American audience. Um, I think what changed in the DNA was that the star of the film, the big star was a woman, uh, was, was Drew Barrymore. And so it changed the dynamic a little bit. Um, there's an interesting story about that film, which was that they chose the Boston Red Sox because they wanted a more downbeat ending than the English film. The English film was about the season 1989, where Arsenal miraculously won the championship with the last kick of the last game of the season. And the Americans decided they couldn't find that Hollywood ending in uh, American sport. So they made sure that they picked a team that never won, the Boston Red Sox. They hadn't won 
um, the the the, uh, the World Series since 1914 or something. And they started to make the film, and the Boston Red Sox started to win. And um, each week of shooting, they won again. And then they got through to the playoffs. And by that time, they were slightly nervous about their script. And, uh, and then they got through to the World Series, and then they won the World Series. And the film very smartly spun, um, and they, they managed to film Jimmy Fallon and Drew Barrymore, they got them onto the pitch for the moment when the Boston Red Sox won after a hundred and something years. But it was, a, it was a very funny story that I lifted, somehow lifted the curse of the Red Sox. Wow, wow. So, so <laughs> it's almost like real fiction sort of propelled real life. Yes, and if you look at that movie, um, that really is them, and it really is the last game of the um, baseball season, and the Red Sox really did win, even though no one thought they would. <laughs> uh, it's also probably the only example where the Americans were chasing a more pessimistic ending than a exactly. British ending. Exactly, and America couldn't let that happen, so it provided <coughs> the Hollywood ending that they didn't think they were looking for. <laughs> <laughs> I've, no, I've seen, uh, I've read High Fidelity about four times. I've seen the movie a whole bunch of times. Um, the book is set in London. The movie is set in Chicago. Mm. Um, I think most people who are listening to us have either seen the movie, read the book. So, I mean, I won't go into the specifics except to say that a protagonist owns a vinyl record store. Um, That's it. That's the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have... Spoiler alert. <laughs> That's it. It's a man who the <laughs> record shop who wants to reevaluate his relationship. Yeah, um, yeah. But I, I have a certain, I have a couple of questions about the setting itself. Um, when, this, when this book came out, it was before the age of Spotify and Audible and all of that. Yeah. And there was a certain kind of person who owned a vinyl store or a video cassette store yeah. or a DVD store. Um, where their knowledge was a kind of snobbery. It wasn't about money, but the fact that they knew a lot of stuff. And they told you, oh, if you're going to listen to Bob Dylan or Led Zeppelin, buy this album over this album. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And they looked down at the customer, they decided what the customer deserves rather than sell him yeah, anything. They, they hated most customers, yeah. yeah. And, and, and there was something glorious about that. And, and a lot of us fans of yours sort of identified with that intellectual power that a certain character has with knowledge. Um, and my Especially question is, when they have no actual power, I think. You know, it's, yeah. a, com it's a compensation. Yeah, exactly. You know, I, I come from a relatively poorer part of India. I come from Calcutta. And what they say about Bengalis is all we've got is intellectual power. You know, that, right. that we, we value wealth in, you know, who's read what and what music, you know, and, and you know, and, you know, what album of Pink Floyd you've heard. We've got nothing else. You know, we have crumbling infrastructure. We don't have that many rich people. It's just so, so you know, when I read High Fidelity, I was like, this is about us. And, right. Oh, well, that's great. Um, and my question is, do you think that that in the age of Google, that's lost somehow with the whole democratization of everything, that that kind of snobbery is lost? Because we can just Google anything now. Everyone has that knowledge. Well, they, they actually possess the music, but they don't have the knowledge. Mm. Um, so even though they, they are walking around with a box in their pocket um, that contains all the music in the world, uh, they, they don't know how to get there. So um, I, I'm still consoled by that. Um, I, I, for me, Spotify and so on has just been incredible. Um, and that's because I know enough to find my way around it. But I know that people who don't know their way around it are going to be listening to the equivalent of Top 40 radio on Spotify anyway. Correct. And, and along with that, do you think the, that person that worked in that store, um, I remember I've, I lived in New York for a few years and there used to be a place called Kim's Video, which was a rundown video store. 
And the guy would tell you, you know, oh, which Japanese horror film do you want to watch? And you tell him a name and he'd say, no, no, that's rubbish. <laughs> watch this earlier thing. You yeah. get something. You know, and that person with that knowledge, uh, where, where do you think that person is now, 20 years down the line? That person from your record store, where would he be today? Well, that's a very interesting question because um, sometimes I thought about writing a sequel to High Fidelity, um, just to have that relationship 10, 15 years down the line. Um, and the thing that stopped me was that I could never imagine where Rob was or what he'd done. And the guys I knew who worked in record stores, they, one of them became a real estate agent, one of them became something else. And I didn't want to write about that. Uh, so I never did it. And then, I don't know if you know, but just recently, the wonderful Zoe Kravitz made a TV series out of High Fidelity and set it now. And what happened in the last four or five years is that vinyl stores are, are popping up all over the place. So those stores, um, they do exist now in much the same way as they did then. It's just that there's this 20-year gap where there was nothing, and I couldn't imagine what the, where those people were in between. So now there's a new generation, and there was the old generation, but I don't know how one transmogrified into the other. I, uh, it seemed convincing to me that Zoe Kravitz would have her own vinyl shop in Brooklyn now, but 10 years ago, I don't know what she would have done. No, exactly, and we should tell Indian audiences this, that it's, um, unfortunately, we don't get Hulu here, but there are bits of it available on various Indian streaming platforms. And I, I saw the episode where a lady wanted to buy a Michael Jackson vinyl. Ah, uh, yeah. Zoe Kravitz. And of course, the debate on music has changed also because it's about now personal character. And, and moral can, whether, behavior. whether Michael ja Jackson's cancelled. Exactly. We, um, I was talking to Zoe about that. I think I suggested that you're allowed to listen because of Quincy Jones's production. Quincy Jones has done nothing wrong, and, and that music is a perfect piece of music production. Therefore, you are allowed to listen. Brilliant. But do you find sir, the story like this, as the culture changes, because of course the story has been made into a Broadway musical, yeah. massive Hollywood film. It's now a TV series, and I'm sure it'll iterate. But as music also iterates, um, do you think every 10 to 10 years, some young person who's doing the show will come back and say, where are we on the landscape of music? <laughs> Is this well, allowed? Is that allowed? Yes. Um, I, I mean, I think it's one of the most interesting things about being obsessed with culture is that the meaning of it changes every few years. And as you get older, you see uh, artists who you thought would survive forever actually slowly dying even though they've been dead for some time. They, their, their meaning has, has changed and they're becoming redundant. And, uh, you know, I was talking to a friend the other day. I, I don't know whether, for example, D.H. Lawrence um, is being read as much as Jane Austen is being read. Um, and that's happened within my lifetime. Uh, we used to have to study D.H. Lawrence, but I don't know if kids are doing that now, partly because... Um, the, the stuff about women in there might be more difficult than it, it, it seemed to us. Um, and the same with, obviously, people like Michael, Michael Jackson. But, yeah, you come in every five years and check something out and see how they're doing. And, and some artists from the 19th century are much more alive than others. Some musicians from the 1970s are much more alive than others. Actually, I'm going to jump to that literature question because you bring up a very interesting point. Um, and I'll come back to About a Boy, uh, which mm. I want to ask you about. Um, You've mentioned in a bunch of places that, you know, certain, you know, certain great classics live on forever. Like, for example, uh, you know, you mentioned Jane Austen, you mentioned P.G. Woodhouse yeah. uh, in one of your interviews. Uh, now, P.G. Woodhouse, it's still very big in India. Um, there are P.G. Woodhouse clubs, etc. But... Uh, recently, I asked a bunch of people in England about P.G. Woodhouse, and not very people knew who he was. Is that and, right? Yeah. And, and I'm curious to know your opinion on, on, on what you think sort of causes this sort of stuff. Uh, Rudyard 
Kipling used to be very big when I was growing up in India. He was part of the curriculum for ICSEs, which is the GCSEs in the UK. But Kipling, having controversial views on the empire, has been dropped now. Um, uh, Dickens, for example, always popular. Uh, it's still in the Indian academic curriculum. So I, I, I always wanted to, you know, I'd love to know because you talk a lot about the classics and, and the sort of yeah. big people of literature. And you think, you know, what do you think makes people last? And um, Well, obviously, with um, Woodhouse, people cannot see beyond the class. Um, uh, there are maybe two things with him. His books are, um, in, in one way, they are not great works of literature. They were written extremely quickly. I think he wrote 96 books. Um, as well as a whole bunch of uh, plays, uh, but they are they are very class oriented, and, and there is no inclusion of anybody apart from the English upper classes in those books. So he is a bit of a hostage to fortune in that way. What I regret about that is that he's one of the most brilliant and natural prose stylists um, in English literature. Uh, and then Dickens, um, I mean, obviously his heart is in the right place. He's on the side of the urban poor. Um, and he's such a fantastic storyteller. His characters have entered the language. Um, there, there's more than one Dickens character that we talk about without people necessarily knowing that it was him in the first place. Scrooge, I guess, being the, 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 the best example. Um, I've just written a little book about Dickens, and um, it's a weird book about comparing Dickens to Prince, as in the musician. It's about creativity. And um, in, in my research, just seeing how alive Dickens is everywhere you look. But I think it is, uh, it's to do with changing politics, and some, some writers um, cannot bear that... Um, examination and some can. And, you know, this, I'm going to jump to a question. I was just telling a friend that we're doing this session. And the reason I bring up Dickens is he said, oh, well, uh, you know, Nick Hornby is the Dickens of, of our times because of the volume of what he's written. Um, uh, and, and I said, well, that's an interesting point. But then I went back and read an essay of yours where um, it was a collection of essays, and I think w w the last essay was titled Shakespeare Wrote for Money. Yeah. Um, and in it, and I'm going to sort of get this wrong, but basically you make the point that literature is not some deified enterprise, you know, where you sit down and it sort of comes to you when you feel like it. You have to do this as a job. And Dickens used to call it jobbing. Um, and, you know, yeah, well, when you... Sorry. So, go ahead, please. My, uh, well, my question. Yeah. Well, um, uh, there's a book called 1599 um, about Shakespeare, and um, they reckon that he uh, more or less wrote four plays in 1599, four of the big plays as well. Um, and he wrote them because he had a theatre troupe to support. Um, they needed new product, new product, new product. Um, the, the competition in London against other theatre companies was fierce. And, um, and this was a man writing under pressure. And uh, I don't think he thought that we would be studying him 400 years later. He, he was hoping to get this play on in the next couple of weeks. Um, Dickens quite often was writing two novels at once. They were serialised, as people know, um, and uh, the first two or three books, he was writing the last parts of the last one simultaneously with the first parts of the next. And, and they were kind of deathless masterpieces of the English novel. But again, he didn't think that. He thought, I've got to get something done. And recently it's, it struck me that if you lined up all the artists who had zero money, and, and had to work very hard for a living and make themselves and make themselves again, and you, and you put them against the artists who had grown up privileged, my list would beat the other list 
every time, every time, whether it's Dickens, whether it's Shakespeare, whether it's uh, Marvin Gaye, you know, all the great people came from nothing, especially in the 20th century. And, uh, and, and the, the privileged people are the ones who tend to wait for the muse to descend. And their work doesn't survive as well, I don't think. And, and do you often approach your writing like that, sir? Like, for example, you've written, you know, most people interviewing you will say it's impossible to know where to focus on because there's so many novels. There are, there are two screenplays, Oscar nominations, hundreds of articles and columns. So when you sit down to write, you tell yourself, I've just got to get this thing done. Like I'm doing a job, you know, I'm chiseling, I'm a craftsman. I'm not a genius of some kind who's... Well, yeah, the genius certainly doesn't come into it. I mean, all I do is my day job, and yeah. um, I don't kill myself. Uh, that's one of the things that shocks me, is realizing how much of a working week I waste, um, you know, on the internet or doing jigsaw puzzles or whatever it is I do. I only work from Monday to Friday. I don't work in the evenings. I don't work at weekends. And, and then people in interviews say, but you've written so much. And that's an accumulation of just being steady enough over a 25 year period. What shocks me is what everyone else hasn't done, not what I've done. And <laughs> the, the, the ill discipline, if you, if you break a book down, my books are like 80, 90,000 words. If you write 500 words a day, and you know 500 words a day, it's, it's two long paragraphs. Um, if you write 500 words a day, that's 160 working days. So you should easily be able to write a book a year um, uh, uh, comfortably. And yet I don't, and I work reasonably hard. The people who write a book every six or seven years and don't do anything else, I think, come on, man, what's going on? What are you doing? <laughs> Life's too short, I think, to waste that kind of time. That's that's incredibly true. I think most of us are doing nothing. We're just wasting our lives on doing Instagram. Doing nothing. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I think there are loads of authors watching you right now instead of writing. I think they're on this. On this uh, it's Zuko. Sunday. They're allowed. <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple of questions on. I, I have to ask about about a boy, which um, was did very well in India as one of the highest grossing comedies. Um, now, do you think? And I mean, just for context, I'll, I'll quickly say the protagonist, and I'm, I apologize if I'm going to mess this up, has a bit of an inheritance, and his name is Will Freeman. And yeah. He doesn't do very much. He doesn't his, do very much. He, um, he... Good um, segue. <laughs> do you think in 2021, where everybody has causes and, and things they care about and the world is so earnest and... It's possible to live like Will Freeman? Like if you have just the right amount of money to do nothing, do you think there is such a character in the world? Oh, absolutely. And I kind of know there is. And um, <laughs> the last generations that it will happen to are people, like the, the Oasis Blur generation, I guess. Um, those guys made enormous amounts of money right before streaming. Post-streaming, you can't make any money. Um, so rock stars from now on will be different kinds of people. They will have to play live a lot more. But uh, the 80s, the 90s, um, not every single person who was in some nameless big band that sold millions of copies is a philanthropist or a charity worker. Or A lot of them are uh, sitting in a country pile or sitting in LA, burning slowly through their money um, and talking very earnestly about some band they might form in a couple of years' time. It, for those people, the years just slip by, I think. You know, there's a, I'm not proud of this. I'm 45 years old, and there's a generation of us that saw this film and thought to ourselves, you know, why couldn't our dads have just sung a song or written a book or something and just left us with just that much money? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. It's the dream, isn't it? It is. And what's brilliant about that book, sir, is that it's not, it's not a lot of money. He's not a Saudi millionaire. He's just enough. 
just enough to stop you from working. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's all you want. It's like £100,000 a year, uh, keeps you comfortable and stops you having to get out of bed. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. It's, <laughs> I, I mean, at least for us, it's still a dream. Um, I know we're going to get a pile of questions from people listening in, but I have, I have to ask two questions. One yeah. about your 2001 novel, How to Be Good, and one about yeah. music. Um, in How to Be Good, and I'm going to screw this up again, um, there's a husband and wife character. Katie Carr is a doctor, and her husband's name is David Grant. Um, now, they want to do good in the world. Um, uh, they, well, he does. She's not so sure, yeah. Correct. She's a bit uncertain. He wants to do good. But then yeah. it, all, it all goes wrong when they have to do good to people that they were not so good to in the past. Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, it was one of the things that interested me was that the wife uh, is uh, by definition, I guess, a good person. She works as a doctor in our National Health Service. So her ho whole moral um, her own moral sense of self-worth is taken care of by being a doctor. But at the beginning of the book, it's clear she's having an affair. Um, so, so she uh, is rather troubled by this. And in the meantime, her husband, who's always been a very cynical, angry, frustrated man, has undergone some kind of spiritual conversion. So she's forced on the back foot morally, and that's where the the drama and the comedy play out, I guess. And, you know, in 2001, you know, in the world before Twitter and all of that, you know, goodness was still a private gesture. Do you think in today's world, this couple would just, would they actually engage in goodness? Or do you think that they would just spout goodness? A lot of the book explores exactly what you ask in the title, how to be good. Yeah, and, what, and how far to take it. And I mean, I think that that's a question in a few of the books is how much do we owe people that we don't know? I mean, I think that's true of uh, About a Boy, true of A Long Way Down, true of How to Be Good. This question keeps coming up. And I think it's a, a question that troubles us all, all the time. Um, and uh, I think some people's goodness is, is purely performative, and then a lot of people actually do stuff. <laughs> and, and that's such a distinction in the 21st century, right? <laughs> the doing of goodness. And, um, Nick, I'm going to read out a question because we already have questions coming in. Okay. Um, and in our last 15, 20 minutes, I'll mix it up with questions from the audience with questions I have. Sure. So this is a question from... Christy Johnson, and Christy asks, football, music, and relationships are the three pillars that your stories and novels revolve around. What would you have been if not a writer, or loved to have been? Well, whenever I think about this, I, I think the only honest answer is I would have been a writer. Um, there's actually nothing that stops you from being a writer. Um, I would have had to do something else to earn a living, I'm guessing, is the, uh, is the thrust of the question. What would I have done to earn a living? Uh, the answer is, for that, I, didn't, I wouldn't really have cared that much. I would have done bits of teaching or, you know, maybe some kind of involvement in the arts. But I would never have stopped writing. It's the same when I imagine retirement. I think, oh, great, retirement. I can, I can write my something or other. <laughs> I don't know what it would be, but it's not very different from what I'm writing now. I, I, I think writers are writers, and there isn't much you can do about it, even if no one's paying you. Exactly, exactly. I mean, yeah, even, like you said, even with retirement, you'd still probably have the same schedule writing. Something. Yes, and, and the same impulse to write. I don't feel right in myself unless I'm doing it. Right, now, um, Mr. Economy, it would be sacrilege to have 45 minutes with you and not talk about music. Um, but before I ask you about music, I should tell you, maybe you'll find this amusing. Um, MTV and Western music came to India in a big way in the mid-1990s, around the time your first books came out. Yeah. And I don't know why this happened, but 
I just want to tell you the bands that became really popular and then ask you my question. Yeah. Um, so that you could judge this live on air on whether yeah, sure. culture deserves this. Guns N' Roses? Uh, some good songs. Uh, became very big in India. Thank you. Don't, don't, Brian, don't, Brian, sorry. Uh, don't Cry is one of my favorite songs. So they became huge. Um, uh, Axl Rose uh, in his mid 60s toured, toured in India. Uh, I had the unfortunate uh, sort of pleasure, I guess, of seeing him play Don't Cry with uh, Alka Seltzer because he had a terrible case of uh, a stomach obsession. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it just to see one of my heroes with uh, oh, no. a digestive and a piano was very unfortunate. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I'll just list out the bands and you, yeah, could, sure. you could tell me if you, if you think culturally we're in a good place. Brian yeah. Adams, very big in India. Pink Floyd, always has been. Crowded House, Depeche Mode, Counting Crows, Simply Red and Aerosmith. These bands became very big in India in the 90s. Well, um, I would say it's not so different from um, what would have been big in Heartland America in, in, the, in the 90s. Um, so, I mean, I, I'd say nothing too objectionable, nothing incredibly interesting. Um, I, I, I'd, still, I'd still want to go into my little niches. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, Crowded House, I think... A time in the 90s were blamed for all the sins of the world, and have since become come to be regarded as a, as a kind of Kiwi Beatles, which um, they really are. They're wonderful. Um, those those records. And this leads me to a follow-up question about your 2002 collection of essays, 31 songs. Yeah. Um, now in it, you've got Bob Dylan, Bruce Springsteen, Nelly Furtado which Indians would have heard of. But uh, there's a band called Teenage Fan Club that shows yeah. up twice on your list. Yeah. And nobody in India knows them. And I'd love for you to just tell us who they are. Well, uh, Teenage Fan Club were part of a wonderful uh, Scottish um, sort of pop punk uh, guitar band um, invasion of the 90s. Um, they sounded a bit like the birds, um, jingle jangle guitars. They wrote wonderful melodies and uh, fantastic uh, guitar solos. Um, there are two albums, one called Grand Prix, one called Songs from Northern Britain, that are two of the most perfect British pop records, I think, rock records. So there you go, India. You have Spotify. I think it's time to listen to Teenage Fan Love. Songs from Northern Britain. Get it on straight after this. Exactly. Um, I'm going to read out a question um, from Simran Jagdale. Last question to come in, uh, which is very different, a little different from all the other questions that are coming in about Arsenal and music and your writing right, schedule. Right. Um, what uh, is your connection, if any, with Indian writing, Indian writers, or India? Um, what aspects of Indian culture uh, in Britain may have influenced you in some way at all? Uh, that's very hard. Um, I think we come from very different writing traditions. There are Indian writers, I mean, Midnight's Children and so on, that of course, um, I have read, all writers have read, and, and very much enjoyed. Um, I, one of my early ambitions was to read A Suitable Boy. Um, one of mine as well. Yeah, and, and it's still, um, at this point in time, un unfulfilled. Um, I think that uh, my main... Uh, influence came from America. Um, I didn't have a voice until I found the American writers who meant a lot to me, in particular um, the American novelist Anne Tyler, who when, the first time I read her book, Dinner at the Homesick Restaurant, I thought, I know this is what I want to do. Um, and I think I can see a way in which I can at least get somewhere near it. And 
Um, <clears throat> I think the scale of Indian literature, the astonishing scale and depth and detail and that sort of bursting with uh, life, um, I think I probably haven't got it in me. <laughs> I, I think it just comes from 1.3 billion people. <laughs> yeah, yes, yes, exactly. So many As opposed to a pathetic 60 million. <laughs> so, um, you know, one of the things that I have sort of a subsequent question, which is one of the things that we grew up with a lot was convoluted Victorian literature. You know, a lot of um, our post-colonial issues with English literature was we wanted to sound like we knew a lot of words and a lot of difficult words so that we wouldn't come across lesser than people, yeah. you know, from England. You know, it was yeah, a bird yeah, we, yeah, ca yeah. we carried and still carried. And then your novels came along and talked about specific places, simple things, music you listened to, places you went, food you ate. Um, London was like, it was that place which was actually there. And were you, were you sort of consciously breaking a tradition that literature doesn't have to be this gilded cage? Uh, because it was, it was so refreshing for readers around the world to see that English literature could be this? Well, I had the same um, problem and complicated relationship with the, <coughs> with the subclause on subclause on subclause. Um, I think that uh, anything, any kind of writing that puts um, opaque glass between us and the world is not helpful to me. And that's why that American tradition of writing, um, where, where, where the writing is clear glass through which you see the world, was incredibly important to me. Why, why Ann Tyler was and why Raymond Carver and Tobias Wolff and those, those American realist writers. I had to go there in my late 20s, 30s in order to import it to England and, and write plainly and simply. Um, but I, I agree that it, uh, the English literary tradition was not helpful to me. Um, I don't think it's helpful to readers anywhere, especially in England. And I think there are ways of being smart um, which don't involve um, uh, the, the ornate prose. Um, I'm going to sort of, that's a really interesting point. I'm going to sort of jump and um, there are a couple of questions here on Arsenal, which I'll yeah. ask you right at the end. But I'm okay. going to jump and ask about the films because yeah. um, you have an Oscar nomination for an education. Um, Brooklyn with, uh, I'm going to mispronounce her name, Sia Sreenan. Both these outstanding films watched all over the world have very strong female protagonists that want to break out of the thing that they're in um, to explore an alternative world. And to some extent, your book Funny Girl does the same thing. You know, it's about a woman who wants to work yeah. in comedy. And so many of these stories are kind of ahead of their time because, you know, Marvelous Mrs. Maisel came out, but sort of Funny Girl had covered a bit of that world, you know, about what is it about um, women characters wanting to break out into a new world from their sort of, from the world that they're given that interests you in these stories? Because thematically... Yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, what happened was um, I found the story of an education, which was a six or seven page essay in the literary magazine Granta. And I suggested to my wife, who was an independent producer, that it would be a good subject for a film. And when she started looking for writers, I suddenly felt very possessive of the material. And I, and I said, can I do it? And in the act of doing it, I, I discovered a couple of things. One is, this is not meant cynically, but it is so hard to make films. Um, it's so hard to make independent films. And, I, and when I wrote that character, I realized that we could get the best young actress in the world to play that character because there are no parts for women that aren't as appendages or, you know, a superhero's girlfriend or whatever. So 
you go to guys with a, for a part and they say, oh, yeah, I really like the script, but I've just been offered $50 million to put on this suit and be in something. And you go to, to a young woman or, or a woman with a part and they say, you cannot take this away from me. This is my part. And it felt so great to be able to work with that level of talent. We had Carrie Mulligan in an education. The second thing I discovered was that up until more or less that point, I'd been writing about men whose only problems really were themselves. Um, you know, the problem with Rob and Will and me and Fever Pitch, uh, the barriers are all self-constructed and that's quite amorphous. And when you look at that women, especially in period, you know, like uh, the 50s, the 60s, which was Brooklyn education, those barriers were not imaginary. They were absolutely real. And it, was, it felt really good to write about something that was real. You think, ah, I see what the obstacle is. And are there any ways around this very real obstacle for this person? So uh, those three became kind of a piece, you know, um, Funny Girl and Education Brooklyn, and also Wild, which um, I wrote for Reese Witherspoon, which was adapted from a book. Um, I got the chance to write about uh, drama that felt solid, I guess. And they're all brilliant films. Um, I have sort of two questions. Uh, one um, is a very, well, three very quick questions. Um, sure. A little more generic. One is your books and films have done very well in Britain, but of course, immensely well in America as well. Do Americans understand British irony? Uh, yes, they do. Um, I think that... Um, Quite often, the gatekeepers of American culture, um, you know, whether it's network television or um, uh, publishers, they, are, they, they understand it too, but they take the decision that they don't think their readers will understand it. And, um, but the, the books found an audience, and it found exactly the same audience as it would have found, uh, as they would have found in England or India or Australia or anywhere else. So... Uh, I, I, I think, yes, Americans absolutely understand irony. And we know from that some of their best sitcom that they, they completely get it. What is, what is Seinfeld, if not that? Exactly, exactly, yeah. And, and a lot of your films sort of bring in that sense of British humour uh, into no, absolutely, America. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah. And my last question is not from me, but from uh, Prathamesh Samant, uh, who asks you, will Arsenal ever get back to the utopian, invincible era of 2004? Uh, well, not in the immediate future. <laughs> um, well, it's, I think you cannot, unfortunately, with the English Premiership, at the moment, unless you are owned by a, a whole country um, like Manchester City are, or an oligarch like Chelsea are, uh, Liverpool, you know, they, they've done well the last few years, but the gap between the top two or three clubs and the rest of the Premiership means that you pretty much know who's going to win the league every year, and you pretty much know who's going to be in the semi finals of the Champions League because it will include other teams from other countries, uh, from uh, teams that are also owned by other countries. And Arsenal don't have that business model at the moment. But cycles change and uh, I think Arsenal have a very good manager. They have a very good set of young players who maybe in five years, if they can keep something together, will be in a position to compete. So there's the answer. So maybe this young Arsenal fan will bother you online in the future. <laughs> but I, I have to say that that 2004 team, uh, they did something that's never been done before or since. So are they going to get back to that? No, because nobody ever has done. So there you have it, Rakesh. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, Mr. Nick Hornby, uh, for a person who has written a series of protagonists who do nothing, 
thank you for doing just the opposite and giving us a giant treasure trove of literature. Well, like um, I say, I do a little bit of something every day and that comes to the same thing. So. <laughs> it's been a pleasure. Um, thank you. I hope Mumbai and India have enjoyed this. I'm going to hand this back to Ratna. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nikon B and Anubhapal, for that very, very engaging and candid conversation. Uh, big thanks to our audience and, of course, all our partners, without whom this would not have been possible. This session was presented by British Council. Tata Literature Live, co-sponsored by Tata Projects and Tata Steel, and powered by Godridge, continues with many more sessions. Do check out our website, datalitlive.in, and if you want to spend some time in a virtual bookshop, Head on to landmarkexcite.com where you can find a lot of Nick Hornby's books. With that, I'll be signing off now. See you next session.